Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 19 to 23, and from the book of 1 Peter, uh, ch- uh, chapter 3, verse 15. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a, a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The second reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. This is the word of the Lord. And I call upon Pastor to bring us God's message for today. Blessed morning, church. And an advanced, uh, spiritually prosperous Chinese New Year to you, uh, because uh, <laughs> I'll be going back to uh, Penang uh, next, next week, uh, in the next few days' time, for the, uh, our family reunion. Yeah? Now, um, if you look at the subject there, why, why is the subject uh, of hope? can be a matter of uh, life and death. Any idea? Why can this subject be a matter of life and death? So even our thinking of this in recent times, my mind was uh, drawn back to this thought because when hope is gone, everything dies. So let me repeat, eh? when hope is gone, everything dies. And Alpha's Reverend Nikki Gumbel was right in saying that. That's why all the more we need to refresh ourselves, remind ourselves or hear for the first time the subject on there is hope for all. Amen? Right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to give you thanks, Lord, that we can gather together in this place. Um, Not only us here, but throughout the nation, throughout the world, there are people gathering together this last day to worship you. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, that we are connected in some ways, Lord, with our brothers and sisters nationwide and globally. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for today that we can come together to hear of your word. May your word, Lord, continue to do that good work, accomplish the purpose for which, Lord, that your word will be sent forth soon. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have a question here. Right. What does one mean by hope? Right? So if you have somebody next to you, you just ask the person, what does one mean by hope? Uh, You can share with one another. (laughs) All right. Okay. Yeah, some of us will have our thoughts. I was thinking about that as well. Okay. To some, a hope is a wish, right? Not too sure some of you uh, had that response to. What is hoped for is just a wish. The outcome is uh, an iffy thing, you know? a 50-50 thing. Uh, 
right? It may come true or it may not. And if you, it is like uh, you have hung out your clothes to dry this morning before you came here and you hope it won't rain. <laughs> By the time you reach home afterwards, <laughs> otherwise you would be like scrambling. Yeah? You will treat the road like a Formula One track. <laughs> However, there's no certainty that what you hope for or wish for will, be, will uh, become a reality. It may rain or not rain where your house is located after the worship service. I also hope for you uh, that it won't rain <laughs> if you have hung out the clothes. To others, a hope uh, is a yearning. Now, recently I saw in the TV the news, uh, a tearful mother's deep longing for her husband who was taken hostage in a war. So she pined for him as the interviewer uh, interviewed her. She pined for her husband to be brought home safely. You, you, you can feel for her. Anyone would, right? But there is a 50-50% 50-50 chance that she may see her husband alive and happily re reunited. Or she may, or he may be dead in captivity as some hostages are now dead in captivity. It's a 50-50 thing, right? A yearning, but it's no guarantee. To others still, hope is a feeling of optimism, an air of self-confidence right? or self-belief. For example, um, for those of us who are into football, and your pastor is also a, a fan of football, <coughs> as I said before, uh, football managers like to say this kind of thing. Not that I want to believe in what they say, but anyway, uh, a professional football manager may motivate his team and also the supporters by inspiring the hope of optimism in them. However, his pep talk intended to make his players and supporters, supporters feel more uh, hopeful or confident of winning the match cannot guarantee the desired outcome. He can do the pep talk until the cows come home, but he cannot guarantee the outcome. The team can win or lose the match, right? Okay. Now, the Bible, the Bible's view of hope is unlike the iffy or the 50-50 thing that some people think hope means. Let's look at two scriptures concerning this. One, from Romans chapter 8, verses 24 to 25, it says, For in this hope, this hope, if you read in context, the verse before, referring to bodily redemption, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. But if we hope for what we do not see, we hope for it with patience. So it's not wishful thinking, right? This biblical hope. And then we read in Hebrews 11, verse 1, the famous well-known verse, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we find here, the biblical hope is an expectancy, an eager waiting for the things not seen. So if you look at the Hebrews verse 11, verse uh, 1, there is kind of a parallel thought there, right? Assurance, the parallel thought is conviction, and the things hoped for, the parallel thought is things not seen. And the biblical hope, as I mentioned, there is this expectancy, you know, an eager waiting for the things not seen. The hope is true, certain, and yes, breathtakingly glorious when Christ comes again. Amen? Right? And that's what we believe. Not sin, but it's true, it's certain. Glorious even. Such a hope means we never need to give up hoping in God 
and his promises, even when things seem, may seem to be hopeless. I'm not too sure about you, yeah, uh, in your circumstance, whether you have come into that situation of feeling hopeless, distraught, despondent, like on the verge of giving up even. I've come, I've experienced that kind of situation before, being distraught in Subang Methodist Church. Like sitting down with you like that, I was in the church. But I did not give up the hope. Lah. That's why I came to the church. to still worship God. Now the Bible has a wonderful way of describing the hope for Christians that you and I, such as, wonderful to hear that in the scripture, is living hope, is the blessed hope, is the sure and steadfast hope. Thank God for the way God's word describes the hope for us. And therefore, we have this hope as the anchor for the soul. What an imagery when you think of that anchor for the soul. You know what it means, anchor, right? If you are on a ship, then you know what the anchor does for the ship. It's, the ship will be so stable amid what's going on in the environment, the wind, and so on. This hope that we have can withstand whatever external pressures that may come our way. All right? Because we have that hope as the anchor, the hope in God. This hope is totally unlike the way others think uh, of hope, such as I mentioned just now, a wish, a yearning, or an optimism, a feeling of optimism. That is just a 50-50 or uncertain thing. The biblical hope that we have is totally unlike the meaning others attach to hope. That is with unknown conditions or unresolved questions in their minds, or the lingering doubts that they have, right? Therefore, those of us who are born again Christians ought to think differently regarding what is meant by the word hope as what the Bible says. So, the next question I want to ask is this, what is the biblical hope? Like a diamond, which has different um, sparkling facets or cuts. The Bible offers the future hope seen in different perspectives. We have only some minutes for us to consider God's word, and therefore we cannot, uh, I don't have the time to speak more than what uh, the time is allotted for me to speak to you. So I'll focus on just a few. <clears throat> Let's look at the first one, the biblical hope. Um, can we uh, read together with conviction? One, two, go. Paul, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his message in the proclamation that I was entrusted with by the command of God, our Savior. Quite a long uh, passage there. So you, when you look at it, and of course the highlights are uh, highlighted for emphasis, the Bible reveals to us that God is the source of hope, right? Correct? Because the word God is mentioned there, he promised, so the source of hope is God. For he promised the hope of eternal life even before time began. So that tells us something, right? That God's original intention is for the human race to live with him eternally. However, this became not possible. Sadly, not possible because uh, with the fall of man because of sin, which Kam Chung also alluded to this now as well. But because of God's great love for sinners, he desires none to perish, but have 
eternal life. And for this reason, God offers the hope of eternal life by sending his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, at the proper time to die for their sins, for our sins, that they, that we may repent, believe in Jesus, and be saved. There is therefore the hope of eternal life for all. Praise God for that. Without, <laughs> without this gift of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, without this hope of eternal life, we will all be continue, we will continue to live in damnation. But thanks be to God for God's grace and mercy and the hope of eternal life. What then is eternal life? You have heard of it before. Before you came for worship service, you are hearing it now. What is eternal, this eternal life? Turn to your partner, turn to your spouse, to your friend in front next to you. Share something about what you know about eternal life. So, all right. So me, Jeff got the right answer, right? Ah, <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Okay, right. So Henry, Lien got the right answer, correct? Oh, yes, yes, correct. Yes. What about you, Kai Tiang? Your wise answer, correct or not? 100, 100 marks. <laughs> well, it was through his prayer to the Heavenly Father that Jesus revealed or defined what eternal life is. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus himself defined eternal life. And this is the essence of the nature of eternal life. I want us to look at what Jesus said or prayed. Together, one, two. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Pause for a while. Take note of the verse, take note of the reference, and therefore next time you can zoom in on that verse, on eternal life. There are some words there I want to just highlight briefly to us. Important words. This knowing, right, that you may know, know, this knowing is especially through personal experience. Of course, we know God has given us a blessed mind, the sound mind that we can understand. Yeah? We never talk down on the mind because it is God who give, blessed, gifted us with the mind. We can understand things. But this also another aspect of knowing, knowing through personal experience. right? Just as you know your wife personally. Knowing the only through God. Look at that. So it is implied here that there are other false gods or idols, but the Heavenly Father is the only true God. One important dimension of eternal life is to know the only true God. There's no mixture. Jesus prayed for sinners to know the Father and also to know him whom the Father had sent. And the immediate context of John 17, uh, verse 3, suggests that Jesus was praying for sinners to know him as the one who saves, the one who gives life to them. So if you go to verse 4, you talk about Jesus saying, right, and praying to the Father. He had accomplished what the Father has sent him to do. But actually Jesus was not on the cross yet, right? But he prayed that prayer that he had accomplished in anticipation of the cross. Because it was on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And the verse before that, verse 2, it, Jesus said he came to offer eternal life. So we see in the context of it, 
that in his prayer, when Jesus all said about divine eternal life, it, has, it is related to what he came to do as a savior, as the one also to give life, right? So in the will of God, no one needs to be without the hope of eternal life, the hope of salvation. This hope is clearly stated in the scriptures. You have seen the first one, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 says, but since we are of the day, let's be sober. I mean, don't get drunk. Eh? Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So you have it there, very clearly, crystal clear. The Bible says these things about hope in the scriptures. Just by the way, a quick reference, hope of salvation in the context of that is the spiritual warfare prayer, right? How we need to guard our mind, yeah? To know for sure, let not the evil one cast doubt upon our mind. We have that helmet of salvation as a powerful weapon. Without that, yeah? Without that, we may be tricked, we may be deceived, and we may go away from the things that we have once experienced of God. By the way, Hebrew 4 talks about people who, have, who once knew, tasted even the goodness of God. They just abandon and go away from God. They became apostate, sadly, yeah? because they had no helmet of salvation right? So brothers and sisters in the Lord, we thank God, our God of hope. He's known as the God of hope, you know, right? for graciously and mercifully blessing us with this undeserved hope. So let us cherish, uh, cherish it ever so dearly. Let us not take it for granted or lightly. All right? The hope of eternal life, the hope of salvation. Let not it become a phrase that becomes so familiar that because I like nothing, but it's so precious. Just remember, without that, where will you be, right? When your life on earth is done. The Bible also speaks of another hope. Uh, the hope that is mentioned in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Okay, let's read together. One, two. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you can see that. You have the hope of glory. I tell to your person next to you, you have the hope of glory, Christ in you. Yeah? Yeah, you have. You have. Both now and for the f in the future, of course, those who are in Christ, Thank God for this glorious message. Thank God for his glorious salvation now and the salvation to be revealed in the last time. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, by the way. The hope of our future glory, what a glorious expectation. And we re greatly rejoice, and we should, in the hope of the glory of God. As it is written in the scripture, it says this in Romans 5, 2, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joy of, joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. One day, we will share God's glory. Sharing God's glory, you know, it, it, just, it, just blew, it, it just blows my mind. To, give in, to be blessed with this thought, this privilege of sharing God's glory. And what an undeserved privilege 
that you and I can have a share in that. Again, it is written in the scriptures, Romans 8, 17, similar thought. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. The texts are bold for emphasis. Sharing God's glory. What a faith-based assurance for us to hold fast to. And all this will happen, the sharing of God's glory, when Christ comes again with power and great glory. Right? Look at the verse carefully again. It is a verse that you may want to consider memorizing even. Now, there is one key thought in this verse, Romans 8, 17, that must not escape our attention. That is, also share in Christ's sufferings. When we believe in Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we ought to be prepared to be willing to share in Christ's suffering too. Jesus himself said, take up the cross daily. Yeah? If anyone wants to follow him, deny himself or yourself. To be willing to share Christ's suffering is so important. Why? The verse tells us, so that we may also share in his glory. So this is trying to say to us that uh, <laughs> we want to have this part of it, Share in Christ's glory, but we don't, have, don't want to have this part, share in suffering, tabolea. Right? It comes in a package. Apostle Paul testified this. Huh? My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, partnership of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So is this our goal too? as born-again believers in Christ. Is this your goal? You have to make, we have to make up our minds, you know, and settle it in our mind once and for all. Is this your goal? Like Paul, goal? To be in fellowship with Christ's suffering. Apostle Paul made it clear also this matter concerning suffering. Philippians 1, 29, if, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him. I mean, some of us have suffered. We know in our midst as well, some people have suffered even through persecutions. That's why they are found in this country. That's why they are found in this church. Do you know that? Because they believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, they were willing to suffer with Christ. No one enjoys pain and suffering, that's for sure. But the reality is this, the pathway to glory is through suffering. Let me repeat. The pathway to glory is through suffering. Our Lord Jesus has gone that way. The way of glory for him was through suffering. There is no shortcut. There is no one thing to share in his glory, but don't want to share in his suffering for his sake. In the case of our Lord Jesus, his suffering included the awful humiliation, the horrible death on the cross. But the Bible tells us this, because of the joy awaiting him, Jesus endured the cross disregarding the shame, the humiliation. Yeah? And now he is seated in a place of honor, glorified in other words, beside God's throne. So for him, 
the pathway to glory is through suffering. And there's no uh, exception for us as well. But the Bible encourages us, the Bible assures us that there is the future hope of glory, the privilege of sharing God's glory. And this is not a 50-50 thing, not fake news, not fairy tale. The biblical hope of glory is a glorious one, is a guaranteed one. So we must keep the hope of glory constant our, in our constant radar. Let not this glorious hope, the hope of glory, stray away from our radar and we lose sight of it. Huh? No, no, no. Keep it in a constant radar, the hope of glory. We need God's word to renew our minds even as we have heard, are hearing God's word today, that, that there is hope for all. So we need God's word to renew our minds, believing with conviction that there is nothing that comes anywhere close to the hope of glory. Do you know that? And I want you to know, nothing comes ever close to the hope of glory. Our own eyes have seen the spirit-inspired words the words that we read just now as well. So, brothers and sisters in the Lord, receive God's word of hope. Ingest God's hope of word, or God's word of hope in our inward being. It is like the prophets of old. They kind of uh, uh, eat up the scroll as it were, no? <laughs> uh, 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 figuratively speaking. Right? So, let us see what Apostle uh, Paul wrote. He said this, huh? for I consider, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Right? So Paul wrote this while he was in Rome and he was in the prison himself. So he's not something as a free man, he, 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 he wrote these things, you know. Paul was in prison in different places as well, beaten even, right? And he also wrote this. Uh, when faced with suffering or emotional uh, uh, pain and physical um, affliction, when we are faced with all this kind of thing, you know, in our emotion, in our body, or understandably, we experience great pain when... Uh, we go through the loss and grief of a loved one in the Lord. Um, Paul's word to the Corinthian church is also applicable to us. And I want to show us this. And he says this, eh? together we will read these verses. One, two, go. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Wow, the things hoped for, the things not seen, these things are eternal. Right? Hebrews 11, 1, just I mentioned earlier. Not only the future glory vastly outweighs or surpasses all comparisons, our present troubles must be seen for what they really are. Small, minute, tiny, and won't last very long. In fact, there's no comparison at all. Yeah, in the earlier verses that we, verse that we saw. Yet, they can, these present troubles of ours, they can, under the sovereign hand of God, result in the eternal glory. Amen? Yeah. Yes, because in all things, God works together with those whom who love him to bring about what is good. That is a better translation. And if you have the NIV translation, that translation is in the footnote. In all things, God works together 
with those who love him to bring about what is good, right? So even when we are suffering in our present troubles, God can work that for us to bring about that situation and bring about what is good for us. We must move on to a next important question. Why can we trust God for these hopes? The hope of salvation, eternal life, the hope of glory. Just These are the just two uh, that we saw, uh, we heard just now. There are uh, 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 many more. So why can we trust God for these hopes? Our God is known as the God of hope, I mentioned just now. And that's why. And as we have heard earlier, our God is also the source of hope. And that's why. And we can trust God for his hopes for us because of his two unchangeable, unchangeable attributes. All right? And this is what I want us to look at with our own eyes. The two unchangeable attributes of God. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Again, I have both the text for emphasis, promise, oath, impossible for God to lie. So we can trust God for these two unchangeable characteristics of God. One, God's character. Yeah? So may you can trust Jeff because you trust in his character, right? Correct. As you grow over in your relationship over the years, right? Maybe courting time, not so sure. Right? <laughs> Still 50-50. <laughs> Just checking him out. But as you make the vow, the marriage vow, marry, you still do not know him very well yet. But over the years, you know him through and through, inside out. And because of his character, you, you, you know that yeah, like God never lies, he never lies, so you can trust in him. So it's very important. God's character, God never lies. God never deceives. That's why we can trust God. That's why may you can trust Jeff. In similarly, because you are imaging God in his character, right? And that's so important for all of us as well. Two, God's promises. God keeps his promises. God keeps his oath to us. So it is like God saying to us, my word is my bond. Right? And because God is faithful to his promises, we can trust him. And likewise, vice versa. Jeff, can now trust in May. Whenever May promise you something, you know her word is her bond to you, right? I'm just using them as illustration. They are dear friends, by the way. They are from uh, Johor Bahru. Yeah? Thank God to be in fellowship with us and come here today. So for these two char characteristics, attributes of God, we can trust God. Now, the fourth question that I have here for us is how can, we, how can we apply the hope message in our lives today? So we want to be practical as well, even as we have understood the principles, the promises of God, and so on. So how can we apply in our lives today? This is one way that uh, we can apply. It says this, but in your hearts, Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Eh? Don't argue with people. Yeah? We never will win somebody for Christ. We become so unattractive if we start an argument with them. Right? Be gentle, be respectful. But this is our 
application, our response. We have heard about the hope of eternal life, salvation of the glory, and there are other uh, blessed hope as well. Go and research that. But in this regard, uh, we must be at ready, at ready, yeah, to share the hope that we have. And why we are convinced about it when uh, when people inquire from us, okay? All right, because if you have known the Father, if you have known the Lord Jesus Christ personally in your experience, that's why it's so important to mention. That's why you can share with somebody that you have this hope of eternal life. Unless you have believed in vain, please not believe in vain. You must have that personal experience of that knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then without a shadow of a doubt, without being ashamed, you can share gladly so with respect and gentleness with others. All right? All right? And so we can, uh, this Chinese New Year, pray like God open the door that we can share the gift of eternal life, the hope of eternal life, the value of eternal life with our loved ones and friends. Share it as the opportunity presents itself before you. You don't know how? Ask God, like the Holy Spirit, bring me the words to speak. Fill my heart to speak in love to them. Trust the Holy Spirit to give you the words. But importantly, don't hoard. Don't hoard it. Don't deny others the opportunity to be blessed by this hope, this glorious hope of salvation, of eternal life, of glory, and so much more. Now, if there is anyone seeking God, you will be blessed to respond to the blessed hope this morning, the hope that you have heard. I, 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 I cannot know among us who are seekers, right? But if you are the one, I pray you be so much blessed today. You have come to the right place. Your search ends here today. God's word is speaking to you. Let me have the privilege to help you, to pray for you after the worship service. Come and see me. I want to pray for you and with you, okay? We have also heard the hope of glory. Someone ask us, is there anyone in pain, in suffering, in any way, physically or emotionally, emotionally abused, physically suffering, Don't let our pain or suffering cause us to stop making progress in our journey on the pathway to glory. I've experienced it before, so I am speaking with first-hand experience because I did not handle my pain, inward pain properly. I stalled. I stalled in my journey on the pathway to glory. I was going actually round and round in a miry clay. Yeah, instead of going forward on the path to glory, I was going no, backward or even down. Right? <clears throat> so don't let a despairing situation to cause anyone even to die without hope. I'm not too sure about you. I'm sure it's just about you also. Lah. Yeah? Whenever you hear of people taking their own lives, I'm sure you also feel very sad, isn't it? Because when hope dies, everything is gone. Yeah? So we don't want people to be without hope. Yeah? And God can use you. Now, let me now quickly share with you um, the late uh, Tim Keller. Some of you may know him, right? He has gone home to be with the Lord now. Uh, his uh, helpful and practical approach or framework uh, if you like, in helping troubled people or people in despair to persevere and press on toward the pathway to glory by navigating uh, their present troubles well. Right? If we can handle our present troubles well, then we can press on and persevere on to the pathway of glory. His counsel is based on Psalm 42, which I've read uh, many years ago as well. It's a wonderful psalm for those people who are 
in despair, it is a wonderful psalm to read to bring us out of that miry clay. And here's a summary of uh, what Tim Keller said. Right? And this will be made available to you as well. He says this, eh? um, <clears throat> I just uh, I watched the video, I just put it as best as I can um, um, in a summary form. He said, in times of despair, there are three things to, that we can do and very practical. And this is a framework for that we can use. Pour out your soul. Get in touch with your feelings, right? Don't deny your feelings. I learned elsewhere from someone as well. He said, uh, sometimes we feel so frustrated, you know, whether it's against somebody or whatever it may be. He said, uh, tell God your frustration. Tell God to his face. God can take your frustrations rather than take, on your, take out your frustration on another person and hit out at the person. Tell it to God, your frustration. God can take your frustration and your feelings, your anger. Speak out your mind to God, in other words. And so that was, I thought, very helpful. And it's also based in Psalm 42 and also Psalm 43 as well. Pour out your soul. Yeah? Don't bottle it up. It's never good for us. Two, he said, engage in self-dialogue. And so these are the some of the words that he mentioned. Talk to yourself. Yeah? Not listen to yourself, but talk to yourself. Just like the psalmist, talk to the self. If you read all the Psalm 42, he was talking to himself. Yeah? Certain verses of it, he's talking to himself. <clears throat> oh, my soul, why am I downcast? Why am I disquieted? He's talking to himself. But he's not listening to himself. Huh? It is not about morbidity. Uh, it's not about uh, being excessively gloomy and all that, right? Uh, it is not introspection. <clears throat> it is about also reminding ourselves of who God is. Sometimes we can forget in our suffering, in our pain, <laughs> right? Remembering uh, what God has pledged himself to do. And that was what the psalmist remembered what God would do in his situation. You read Psalm 42. Remind yourself of that. And then also, he said, defy or resist the devil. And then say to God, uh, uh, say to himself, uh, I shall yet praise him, my Savior and my God, or my help and my God. Try it. Try it and say it. When you're in deep trouble, in deep pain, say, you know, I shall still praise you, God. I shall still come to you. You are my helper. You, if you say it one time, uh, I tell you that breakthrough will come for your life in the flesh. Right? Thirdly, he said this, reorder your hope or refocus your hope. Huh? So redirect and put your hope in God. Not focus on your problem as it become as it, it is the central thing, right? God is a central being for you. Put your hope in God. Redirect your thoughts to God. Forget not all His benefits. Do not forget in our troubles as if God has not never blessed us before. Huh? Remember one benefit of God. Be thankful to him. Remind yourself of God's truth. And there are many God's truths. And they say God justifies. So he don't dwell in our guilt or on the past. Uh, God sanctifies. And therefore, I can change because of God. God can change me. God's truth can change me. Right? God adopts me. If you feel very, very hopeless, right? God adopts me. I am love. I'm God's child. Remember the truth of God's power of resurrection. Right? If there's any, anyone in the bondage of the fear of death, then you can say, I'm not afraid of aging. I'm not afraid of dying. Because of God's truth of the power of resurrection. Right? So you will praise him, your savior and your God. Amen? Right? Amen. Amen. Yeah? And then I pray that many of you, including myself, will be God's instruments agents to tell so many people 
because there are so many people who are despairing, not to mention taking, thinking of taking their lives. So I must finish with some final words. Tim Keller said this on a different occasion. Yeah? He said this, biblical hope is being certain about the future in a way that affects how you live now. Okay, let me repeat. Biblical hope is being certain, not 50-50, yeah, about the future in a way that affects how you live now. Of course, when he said that, he will be probably thinking of the future, like in Jeremiah 29, 11, yeah? God has promised us a, a future and a hope, right? And God has given us a glimpse of what is to come as well, right? Glimpses of here and there. And you want to know a glimpse of heaven itself? You just have to read Revelation. Then God gives us a picture of that as well. God has given us that glimpse, that future that we can look forward to. So that kind of understanding of the future that God has given to us should affect us how we live today. Even in the time when we are in distress, in pain, of, or having experienced a loss. Yeah? So I was finding this, that how true, I was saying that how true, what Jim Keller said about this, biblical hope. In the storms of our life, so hold fast, the confession of our hope without wavering, God who promised is faithful. That's from our scripture reading, Hebrews 10, 23. So nobody needs to give up hoping on God when things seem hopeless. Nobody. When we don't give up hoping on God in a seemingly hopeless situation, we have the biblical hope as the anchor of the soul. Amen? Nobody needs to be without this hope of eternal life, salvation, and glory. So there is hope for all. There is room for all even. There is hope for all to be renewed, revived, and be restored. With Christ, there is hope. Hope of salvation. Hope of eternal life. Hope of glory. Indeed, so much more. What a generous God of hope we have. Amen? What great blessings to cherish, remember. And not only to cherish and to remember, but to share that others may be blessed and they will bless others. Let us pray. Just spend some moments in your quietness. Perhaps you have something that you want to say to God. Is it a frustration that you want to speak up to God? Is there a pain that uh, you want to tell God? Is there some brokenness, even in a relationship, that you want to express it to God? This is a good time because the God of hope hears the prayers of his people with compassion, with blessing. Father, 
in this special moments Lord with you hear the people's Lord pray unto you with their needs their deep help, felt needs Lord to you even their spiritual needs Lord hear their prayers remember Lord those of us Lord who are maybe struggling even in our faith help us God renew us revive us restore us rekindle our first love for you O God Lord for those of us who could remember the times when you have helped us when we were distraught even in the midst Lord of the church when we came nobody knows you know but we still faithfully come came along among your people not many know our hurts our distress our distraught but you were there you saw us you help us you lift us up we remember that and so we thank you for your mercy for your grace thank you so much Lord for that special moment in those times when you have helped us or even in this time that we have experienced your love once again your help your salvation your deliverance you are our saviour you are our God we will ever praise you people say Amen